Okay, thank you for coming. Um, so I think I'm supposed to introduce myself. Uh, professionally, I take photos, I find photos of cats on the internet and I put them in pleasing arrangements. Uh, and, uh, you know, I also do embedded security research. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Red Balloon Security. Um, we've been doing embedded security research for about at least a decade. Um, and uh, I just heard from the previous presenter that people buy Cisco things from eBay. I mean, that's, I mean, who's ever done that before, right? And, you know, there was a talk about, you know, doing the software stuff, the firmware stuff, right? And then eventually you will push the attacker into the hardware. Uh, I think Jaden is uh, in the background, uh, back over there. So one of the vulnerabilities that we disclosed and, and worked on last year was uh, this thing called Thrangry Cat. Um, it's interesting for at least two different reasons. So the first reason is that this is the first vulnerability that was named after entirely unpronounceable emojis. Right? So that's, that's one. And two, this was a vulnerability we found in the FPGA trust anchor uh, module inside pretty much all of the modern Cisco uh, firewall switches and, and routers and, and things like that. Um, and this was interesting because this was a you know, a vulnerability that was fundamentally in the hardware design of this trust anchor module that was exploitable remotely over a software vulnerability. So, you know, once you push the attacker into the hardware, right, sometimes, you know, you end up with a situation where the attacker can take over your hardware and win forever. So, you know, once we get there, we, we also have a whole lot of problems to solve. But um, today's talk is an update to a talk that we gave here in 2018 on uh, end day analysis inside ICS firmware. So, let's see, does this work? Yes, all right. Uh, I know Joseph Pandoga is probably gonna see this on YouTube uh, in a few months, so I'm obligated to say that in 2018, you know, two very handsome researchers came here and talked about the research results that we got from writing a very small Python script. Uh, we felt a little bit guilty for you know, writing the script, uh, you know, because it was really just 20 lines of code. Um, you know, granted that 20 lines of code called the massive library framework that we built to do pretty much universal uh, unpacking analysis modification of all sorts of firmware. But um, what we did was, uh, you know, we asked the question of, well, finding vulnerabilities inside, you know, industrial control PLC firmware, you know, people have been doing it, it's certainly possible, but uh, what's the least amount of work we can do to do this, and then our answer, of course, was, well, you can cheat a little bit, and also you can automate a whole lot of it, and we came up with this approach of finding end day vulnerabilities inside the firmware components, inside common, well, common things that we find in all sorts of uh, industrial control and utility power management uh, embedded things. Okay, so uh, now we're back in 2020. Uh, immediately after we gave this talk, we met some friends, uh, one friend from, uh, I know, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard of there like a little lab that does stuff, you know, in this sort of thing. Uh, and then we met a friend from Cyber ITL, and we kind of talked over happy hour and we came up with this idea of, hey, you know, wh what if we run with this idea and push it a little bit forward and automate this uh, and, you know, collaborate and see what comes of it. And I guess, you know, a little bit more than a year later, uh, we're here and I'm, Really happy to share some of the results that we found so far. Um, it didn't take us a year to do this research. It took us something like nine months to get the contracting done. Uh, and it wasn't even you know, because of a budget reason. It was working through all the complicated ways of being able to share firmware and research results uh, with each other. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the themes of what I want to talk about today. Um, uh, it's 2020, but it's still really difficult to look inside the firmware of things. Uh, it's much more difficult to do that for you know, a PLC or a RTU or some kind of a fault protection relay, you know, things that run really important things, uh, versus something that is, let's say, the, sort, you know, the, the code to you know, uh, your web browser, right, or some piece of code that runs in your laptop. Um, you know, there's some technical reasons for it, but I think a lot of it is still the way we think about you know, the proprietary nature of these you know, uh, opaque firmware images and how we don't want people to look inside. But, uh, well, we found a way to, you know, look inside these firmwares and share that result with each other. Um, and we are going to present some, well, I don't know if you're going to be uh, surprised or not, but some, we have some interesting findings. Uh, 
Okay, so first, what is an ende, right? Uh, an ende is an exploitable vulnerability that everyone else knows about except for you. And you being you know, either, well, pretty much the user of these embedded devices. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say somebody comes along and looks at a, a software component or a library uh, inside a thing that's used very uh, commonly inside embedded devices. Um, and you know, I'm gonna use the example of one VXWorks vulnerability. So let's say it's VXWorks, right? And you know, somebody finds a VXWorks vuln and somebody writes that up, publishes it, maybe there's a CVE, right? And you as the user or the vendor who makes this uh, equipment will have to ask yourself, huh, I wonder, you know, like the 100 plus embedded things that I depend on, you know, which one runs VXWorks and which one is going to be affected by you know, this vulnerability? Um, and for the folks who make the equipment here, how many of you guys remember getting the, the email or the call saying, what version of VXWorks do we run and what do we have to do to fix all this problem last year? Uh, anyone? At least one person, right? And uh, people who you know, operate these things, uh, how, how many of you guys remember getting that email of like, how many things in our network runs VXWorks and how do we fix this stuff, right? Uh, this is, you know, a very, <clears throat> if you're the manufacturer of this, this might be a little bit easier to answer, but if you are an operator that buys from, you know, the typical vendors, uh, you know, it's really difficult to actually find out that answer today. Um, so, well, let's think about this. You know, so typically, let's say we find uh, a vulnerability in OpenSSH or, you know, some part of the Linux kernel, right? Within, you know, sometimes hours to days, maybe sometimes weeks, uh, a patch is issued out and then a whole bunch of software gets uh, repatched or re recompiled and the binaries get pushed out to, you know, lots and lots of users. So we're talking about a reaction cycle of, you know, maybe a day to a week or, or so. Uh, but inside industrial control equipment, you know, this is much slower, right? Even if you generate the patch, uh, it's going to be years, uh, realistically, when before, you know, the majority of your users uh, ever actually apply those patches in, in the real world. And I'm being very generous by saying years. Sometimes it'll probably never happen, you know, not even close to 100%. Okay, so let's see. Here's a, uh, okay, right? And then you have to ask the question, you know, if I know that VXWorks runs on this one thing because I so happen to be, you know, writing the firmware for it because I'm making this equipment, or I, you know, tore the thing apart and I'm the operator and I know that it runs on this specific device, then I can answer that for one device. But, you know, how do you answer that for every single device that you have, you know, in your infrastructure, right? Uh, you know, it'd be nice if we had nutritional facts things, you know, like, right, for embedded devices, so these are all the components and here are the versions and, you know, but something like that does not exist today and that's part of the problem. Okay, so here's the, uh, the 20 lines of code that we wrote. So by cheating a little bit, you know, in 2018, we borrowed the work of some other very smart people who worked probably a long time to find this vulnerability. Uh, it, this specifically was three vulnerabilities disclosed by researchers from Exodus Intelligence uh, on a blog post, right? So this wasn't even really a CVE. It was somebody probably you know, saying, hey, these are interesting things. Uh, I'm gonna write a post about it uh, and share some IDA you know, screenshots. But uh, what this affected was uh, VXWorks, everything basically from 5.5 to 7, <laughs> right? And that's a, it's a big old swath of things. Um, and it's, I don't think anybody here will be surprised that a lot of industrial control PLC stuff and um, you know, power management equipment runs you know, VXWorks uh, within that range. So what we did is uh, we said, okay, with you know, like the small amount of firmware images that we have on hand, let's you know, automate the analysis of all of these embedded device firmwares inside industrial control. So the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out how to unpack that firmware. So sometimes we see you know, encrypted firmware, sometimes we see obfuscated binary formats. Uh, it's usually not as easy as just hitting, you know, like running unzip. Um, so you know, we have an internal infrastructure for doing that type of analysis. So we wrote a little thing that basically said for you know, everything inside industrial control that we have, let's identify not just the uh, firmware version or the version of VXWorks, but let's look at the attack surface and see if that attack surface is reachable, right? So if you can do that analysis, you can say, well, you know, we'll have some vulnerabilities that we can disclose. Uh, so 20 lines of code, I think the thing took like maybe 45 seconds to process because we didn't have all that many firmware. Uh, and when we came here to present, 
we thought that this was a really interesting result, but we couldn't actually disclose you know, which vendors were, were uh, affected at that point because the first vendor, the patch, would still need another six months uh, before uh, the vulnerability would be patched, let alone you know, that patch being applied in the world. But keep in mind, when we came across uh, this vulnerability, this vulnerability has been known for uh, two years. Right? So this was, you know, we did this in 2018. This was a blog post from 2016. Right? And when we disclosed this, the first patch, I think, came out in like June of 2019. So think about the time frame here. Uh, so uh, what happened? Well, OK, so if you find the things that run these things uh, in VXWorks, and if you had a way to analyze whether the vulnerability is not just you know, the binary of the vulnerabilities in the firmware, right, but you know, the, the actual code path is reachable at, from an attack surface, then what you get is basically you win a sack full of you know, end days that you have to go and disclose. And a lot of people have to do a lot of work to go fix, uh, which is uh, basically you know, what happened. Right? So, you know, when we presented, you know, we said, like, today's situation is like this. So what happens if you have, you know, one vulnerability like this that you have to go fix? Okay, you know, that's something that if we have this once a year, uh, you're going to spend, if you're, the, if you're making this equipment, you're probably going to be spending, you know, a good chunk of your resources just kind of backporting uh, security patches in the vulnerabilities that you know about. So, you know, maybe you have three. Okay, fine. You know, maybe we have the resources to manually go and make you know, three patches per year, uh, and then once the patch is out, every operator on every infrastructure will have to go and make sure that that patch is, you know, pushed out correctly, right? Because uh, a patch is useless if no one uses it. So, you know, think about all of the work that we have to do for, let's say, three major vulnerabilities, you know, of this nature per year inside the major devices that we use. So let's say you have three, four vendors, you know, right? You're talking 10, a dozen of these vulnerabilities. That's a lot of work for a lot of people. So what happens, you know, <laughs> what happens in the future? And this is really today. Okay? So instead of three vulnerabilities, what we've proven out is that we've been able to automate the mining of vulnerabilities, end-day vulnerabilities. So instead of doing this uh, with human time, we're doing this in machine time. So instead of you know, one vulnerability a week or month, you know, we're talking about being able to generate these with a fire hose. Right? So, you know, this is clearly you know, the, the reactive strategy that we've been using up to now of you know, somebody finds a vulnerability, they tell the vendor, and the vendor makes a patch, and everybody gets an email to say, please patch, and all the operators goes out and does the patching. Right? This is clearly not a tenable solution. We're not going to win at this one, right? because we simply don't have the, the time in the year uh, to, fix, you know, to reactively patch one vulnerability at a time, because we're now in the age of you know, vulnerabilities and the analysis being done at machine speed. OK. Right, so uh, in 2018, I said, okay, so, right, uh, June of 2018. So I guess we did, oh yeah, we did this like January 2018. So it was a year, okay. So uh, June was the first uh, patch that came out because of this disclosure. And I put in air quotes because, again, some other smart people did this vulnerability research on VXWorks, you know, like a year and a half before we did. And all we did is basically run a little analysis script to find that vulnerability inside a set of, you know, small set of things that firmware images that, that we happen to, to have had. So uh, the first vulnerabilities were found or patched inside Siemens equipment, you know, rugged comm switches and other, other devices. Um, and then, I, well, the takeaway from the 2018 talk was, you know, what happens in the future when instead of this, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of these vulnerabilities that we have to go fix and patch. And then we kind of went away and did a bunch of you know, other research on other embedded things. And then this happened, OK? <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember, um, Artemis research dropped, I think, something like 11 vulnerabilities inside VXWorks uh, all at the same time. You know? And it was, uh, here are a bunch of vulns, people go fix it, right? Like, have a good day. So, I would assume that if you're a manufacturer, if you are uh, involved in making embedded things in this vertical, uh, chances are you probably spent a good chunk of your, or your time last year thinking about whether you're affected. And chances are you, know, you probably have some product that uses VXWorks. And, and two, you know, what you're going to do to fix these 11 vulnerabilities. Right? So you know, that's a whole lot of work. And again, you know, just because somebody publicly discloses 11 vulnerabilities inside VXWorks, doesn't mean that there's not another hundred in there that you know have not been publicly disclosed. So 
what are you going to do about this? Right? This is a, a ton of work. I guess, you know, okay, so the takeaway from two years ago was, okay, we're going to live in a future where we're having, you know, instead of one or ten, we're, we're talking about vulnerabilities being discovered at machine speed, and we're humans, and it takes a long time and a lot of resources for us to push out these patches, so we cannot think that the current reactive strategy that we have for security is going to be tenable you know, for much longer. And I'm pretty confident that we now live in that universe where it is no longer tenable. So uh, after 2018, we came up with uh, you know, this idea of working together with INL and CyberITL. So Idaho National Labs, right? they have uh, a lot of very smart people and some nuclear reactor things that they get to play with. And you know, they're national labs, so they have uh, a ton of experience at exploiting embedded devices in ICS and power. And they also have a corpus of firmware images that they've collected over the years that we can analyze. Um, and then uh, CyberITL is, how many, have, do you guys know about CyberITL? They're doing super cool work. So I have a slide that they made, but basically this is a nonprofit organization that was started by uh, Peter uh, Mudge and Sarah Zacco. Um, and their goal is to basically you know, measure software security from a metrics perspective. And I'll go into details of you know, what that means. But uh, you know, they basically have all these really interesting algorithms that look at a piece of code or binary and will tell you, you know, something like, well, how complex is this code? Because we know that the more complexity the code has, uh, the more vulnerabilities it tends to have. And you know, are the, uh, the build process inside the binaries you know, using the latest technology in terms of security? Like, did you enable stack cookies? Did you enable non-executable or non-writable code or code region and, and things like that? Uh, and then they produce a score, right, of um, you know, who is better and who is worse at security overall between people who supply software. And over the, the last few years, you know, they've been moving into, and we've been helping them uh, get into embedded device firmware more, because once you shed the light right, on you know, how we're doing in firmware, uh, well, we saw that you know, we're going to see that there's a whole lot of catching up to do right, for us between you know, your latest uh, PLC firmware versus you know, the binary that ships inside like Internet Explorer even. And then, sure, Rebelin Security, we have a massive framework for automating the uh, unpacking, analysis, modification, and repacking of firmware images. And the reason why we have this is, well, one, uh, my PhD research at Columbia focused on, on this, and also, you know, this is the framework uh, that we use to inject host-based defenses directly into the firmware binary uh, of things that we want to protect. So if we get all three of these people right, in the same room and we figure out how to uh, legitimately share you know, information with each other, uh, I'm, I think you guys know, where, you, can, you can see where this is going. Right? So here's the plan that we came up with. Uh, plan stage A, right, or one, INL figures out a way to uh, share the firmware images that they are willing to share with CyberITL and, and Red Balloon. Uh, and I, well, okay, so. I got a, a text message from somebody saying that I have to say that the first round of firmware images, or the firmware images that we used in this round of research, uh, is all publicly available. So this is, you know, not something that is super secret. But you know, the the hard part still is even if it's publicly available, you know, how do you unpack it? How do you look inside the firmware itself? Because a lot of times it is just an encrypted binary blob. Uh, so you know, once we have access to this firmware. Red Balloon has the capability to unpack and analyze the firmware, and so does CyberATL uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, INL also has people who are really good at pwning, right? So we did this uh, exercise of, you know, is there a way for us to, well, shoot for the easiest zero day that you can find in something like this? Uh, ideally, nothing that would take you more than like a day or half a day to find. Uh, find one instance or one example of that vulnerability inside one piece of firmware. And Red Balloon will go out and, using that minimum verifier, uh, go out and do this back analysis to figure out how many other, how many other devices and firmware versions have that uh, vulnerability. Right? So we're not talking about you know, doing this research for a month and then you know, running 10 seconds of computation. We're talking about, let's find a, you know, some easy to identify zero day and then running 10 minutes of analysis to figure out really how big this impact is. OK, so here's what. We found, well, OK, so the first stage of this research was uh, you know, we started with 40 plus images. These are 
This came from four different major vendors in, in uh, industrial control PLC devices and also power and utility control devices. Um, the, the role of this is uh, we're not going to name any specific vendors and we're not going to disclose any technical details about the, the end day vulnerabilities or the zero days that we found. But what I think is most important or more interesting than that is let's look at the statistics of what types of things that we found and how far back in, in time this goes. So the firmware images that we looked at were released anywhere between, I think, today and five years ago, right? So it's up some of them, the oldest firmware image was released five years ago. Uh, and okay, so the, uh, the end day uh, that was, so we took 13, well, okay, so the, the corpus of uh, firmware images that we looked at, it kind of broke down into you know, two major clusters and a bunch of small little dots. So one cluster were devices that used VxWorks in some ISA of some sort, and the other one was uh, you know, Linux, as you can expect. So we took 13 firmware images and we went through multiple uh, VxWorks vulnerabilities, including the Artemis one, uh, the, the 12, I think, or 11 that was disclosed in Artemis and some other ones that we found. Uh, and what we found was, um, right, we had multiple uh, high CVE score vulnerabilities inside, I think, 100% of the VX4 images that we looked at. Um, right, 100% of the VX4 images that we looked at had at least one severe OS level vulnerability that is known already. Um, okay, so another thing that we found. Uh, some of the firmware images incorporated uh, OS level upgrades to the firmware, right, that sometimes address the, the vulnerability. So th this is not, you know, just because you keep up to date on the latest firmware doesn't guarantee that, you know, the, the OS has been patched against vulnerabilities that is already known. Um, but at least, well, every single one of these had one vulnerability, right, that is really bad, that is unpatched. Um, Okay, so the next set is we looked at 30 plus different uh, Linux-based firmware images, and you, it's much worse here, but you know, it's not because Linux is worse, it's because more people have looked at Linux and there are more end days that are known about the various components inside Linux. Um, so there were hundreds of end days. I don't think we, well, I don't remember the, the exact number off the top of my head, but you know, it's, it's a three digits. We're in triple digit territory. Uh, and you know, we, we had instances of the latest firmware being shipped with um, some publicly known end days that are fairly old. Uh, and I'll go into some more details about that. So, um, part of this analysis was not just looking at, you know, matching a, a vulnerability within a, a firmware image and matching the version in, of that image inside some piece of firmware. We wanted to look at, you know, whether those vulnerabilities were actually uh, accessible, right, in the attack path. So. You know, what we've seen in other verticals aside from outside of industrial control and power is that, you know, just because something you know, runs, let's say, a 3.6 kernel uh, doesn't mean that, you know, somebody didn't do a lot of work to backport all of the kernel level security patches into that version. In fact, you know, there are companies that make their living doing that sort of thing, and it's really important. Uh, but, you know, it's no guarantee that, like, every single a security patch is backported to like every version of an old kernel that you, you, you find. So what we did was we went back and analyzed whether security back patches or, or security patches were backported to older versions of known vulnerable things. Uh, and the answer is no. Right? Like it, it very rarely happens here. Um, let's see. So you know we found we did find that some operating like some old Linux kernels had some security patches apply to it, so somebody in there is definitely doing some of this work, but it is definitely not as pervasive as we see in other verticals um, and other types of devices. Okay, so, and uh, let's see, we also, and this is where, uh, you know, INL came up with uh, a very easy, fairly easy to identify zero day, and we did this analysis of, you know, how many devices uh, are impacted uh, with this one zero day in one instance of the firmware. Uh, so, you know, the one that we looked at, well, each of, I think there were three, or two, three, um, each of these were, took, you know, less than one day to find, but provided fine. The person who did this research is pretty good, so one day is, you know, like a relative measure, but, you know, these aren't incredibly complicated to, to identify. So, uh, you know, these things uh, basically were, you know, hard-coded passwords or hard-coded encryption keys, 
or uh, you know privilege escalation things within you know like logical flaws within in the firmware. So we're not talking about very complicated you know memory corruption or you know code execution, uh, but you know so easy to find vulns. And then once we found these, the what we want to do is well let's see how many uh, older firmware images and how many other types of devices have exactly the same uh, vulnerability. And the answer is 100 uh, percent, right? So you know, the, the zero days that we found, right, which are being disclosed, I hope, as we speak, uh, right, was uh, not fixed in any of these versions. And these, these bugs go back enough that, you know, I think the oldest firmware image that we had was five years old. So every single one of these phones we found uh, were 100% within the device, all the firmware images that we analyzed for that type or family of device. Uh, I know I'm being very vague. But you know, so we're still working with the vendors to fix these vulnerabilities. Uh, but you know, just you know, with let's say let's say three days of work and less than ten minutes of processing, we probably created you know a whole lot of headache and a lot of work enough for you know, like a, a, let's say a dozen people to you know, like have to work some weekends, right? So you know, clearly this is not the right way to uh, go forward. But you know, zero days and end days uh, were pretty pervasive inside. The firmware. So that's what uh, INL and Red Balloon did. So next, let's talk about this. Okay. So Cyber ITL, and this is uh, I'm presenting work that was done by uh, Sarah and Tim Carson, but you know, uh, unfortunately they couldn't be here. But you know, so they are a nonprofit. This was funded by Mudge or founded by Mudge and Sarah, uh, and their goal is to educate and empower consumers and the public. Right. So just like how. Uh, UL will rate the safety value of a light bulb in a chair. Uh, the goal of Cyber ITL is one to be a nonprofit, so they're not beholden to the the, peop the vendors who make this stuff, but two to you know give some sort of uh, trustable, well, well some type of a transparent way to evaluate the securityness of a thing, just like the safety value of a, a chair or a light bulb. And the way they go about this is by developing algorithms that measure not you know, the number of end days or vulnerabilities they find in software, because you, know, you don't know what percentage of vulnerabilities you've identified. But instead, they look at various metrics of code and say, well, like I said, you know, more complicated the code, uh, the more likelihood there will be vulnerabilities and, and things like that. And then based on that, they will create a score that measures how secure something is. So if we can shine this flashlight into all uh, you know, uh, firmware images inside PLCs and, and power, uh, that'll be really good. And so we did the first step with them. So what they did, I think a year and a half ago, was uh, they looked at a whole lot of different IoT things, right? So these aren't very expensive, you know, some enterprise stuff, but a lot of consumer things like access points and home routers and IoT doodads. Uh, and, you know, so they had a few different dimensions, and uh, I'll zoom into uh, one of these, but basically, you know, each of these is, I think, tw one of 22 vendors, and this is the aggregate security goodness of each type of thing. So we're talking about thousands of images analyzed over, you know, a period of years. Uh, and, you know, basically, the, the larger that blue thing in the middle of the circle is, the better, the more secure the thing is under this sort of uh, metric. Okay, so, ooh. Well, okay, so... And then we did the same thing to not cheap IoT things, but things that are much more important and much more expensive, right? So, you know, what do you, like, I think you guys can kind of guess where, what the next slide will say, but think about this, right? Uh, what is this, how do you compare the security value or goodness of something that is $60, right, that does Wi-Fi versus something that is, I don't know, like eight, ten thousand $10,000 that controls Really important stuff where you know people's safety is in uh, uh, in jeopardy. Okay, so like imagine the right answer is either yes or no. Right? Are the more expensive, important PLC things more secure than the super cheap IoT things? And so there's no. It's a, you know it's not great. That's not a good answer. But what they found qualitatively, well quantitatively, was that uh, PLC firmware and uh, the power control firmware that we looked at is no better and no worse than your typical um, IoT firmware in terms of security. Uh, and I hope there is a rendering. Okay, so let's look at you know, what they mean by this. So they looked at 
you know, a few different dimensions, uh, for example, whether ASLR is applied, right? So, you know, this is, uh, this is, this shows a lot of different problems that we have within the, you know, firmware of these industrial control things, because what happens if you don't have an operating system that supports ASLR, right? You can't use it, uh, but they also looked at things of whether StackGuard was enabled during compilation, right? So, you know, and the other types of uh, industry standard software security things that you can easily turn on or not turn on, right? Because if you are shipping firmware without StackGuard, that means, you know, you could have done it, but you didn't do it, so there's probably something missing within that security or process. Um, but then again, right, like what if the code that, or the, the devices you, you run are built on an operating system that literally cannot support ASLR, you know, so you're gonna get a zero for that whole quadrant or the, that dimension. But um, what they found uh, with this small corpus that we analyzed was that, yeah, industrial control things are no better or no worse than your typical home router and other IoT things. Uh, so we can definitely, I think we need to do a whole lot better, right? Um, you know, so their takeaway is that there are probably a lot more problems, right, underneath this that we have to go address, right? This is not just that, you know, we're no worse than a home router, it's that out of these little things that we looked at, um, you know, there's some vulnerabilities that probably suggest that there are a whole lot more uh, vulnerabilities that we don't, know, we, we don't know yet about and things that are super important that controls the world. Okay, so uh, I think I'm out of time, so. Questions? Feelings? <laughs> All right, I can't really. Thanks. So, any, any questions? I can't see if. Uh... So, well, do you have a question over here? Yeah. It's not a question. Maybe more of an open ended comment, but I guess. Does that mean that. Maybe you saw that. Sorry, okay. I didn't know this. I can speak softly. So, so I guess if you're saying that, you know. Um, when you look at home routers, switches, home IoT, the firmware that was embedded in that, you looked at the kind of programming practices that went in are no better or about the same level that we can find at control systems. Yeah. Products, right? So obviously control systems should be, are more important, should have better practices. What we're finding out then I guess is, would it be, would the assumption be then that programming practices that are going into to firmware for control systems are just basically the same as you'd find anywhere. There's no special skills that are being applied for firmware for control yeah. systems, and there, there, there needs to be, right? Sure. So how does, is there any effort behind like identifying programming standards or? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, what that one little circle shows is a, a number of really interesting things. So, one, sure, some development teams are probably not enabling every single security feature through the compilation process. That's one. But two, you know, if we look at PLC firmware and you know, industrial control safety critical firmware, uh, you might not be able to turn on some of these things for you know, regulatory reasons. You might, might not be able to turn it on because you're using a fairly old tool chain that's not right, LLVM and the latest and greatest because you might not be able to because you know, safety certification and all that stuff uh, depends on it. Uh, you might not even have the source code to some of this stuff, right? You might have a binary that needs to live in this thing that you know will work that you don't get to change. So it's not just you know people not doing the right thing at work. I think there are a whole lot of other limitations and constraints about you know how difficult and expensive it is for us to you know turn on these features. And then plus you know once we turn it on, when we make the next firmware. How expensive and difficult it is to push these things out to make sure they actually get right, used. Right, so and that would feed into like maintaining that source code for the future and also in compatibility with other systems right. that we need to work at, okay. Right, um, and if you, you know, again, if you use an operating system that doesn't support ASLR, right, you can't right, turn on ASLR. Right, yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yes, um, so you correctly mentioned on the fact that it's kind of hard to uh, unpack this firmware because, of course, vendors want to protect their, their code, right? So would you mind to elaborate on strategies or suggestions you might have on automatically unpack firmware on a large scale? Yeah. Like suppose so, you want to analyze hundreds of firmware, how you do it like in a kind of automated form? Definitely. So, you know, over the last, well, when I, we started doing this at Columbia in, over 10 years ago, it was really a pain to you know, automate unpacking and analyzing firmware. Uh, 
over the last decade, well, so we created this thing called Frack, and it was initially my sort of hope that we can open source Frack, which is the framework that we're using, so that way we can start sharing, you know, by we, I mean security researchers can start sharing the contents or, you know, the structure of firmware without having to, you know, deal with or break NDAs and all that stuff. But we got calls from three different lawyers who had three very different opinions about you know, that, one from the university, one from the com our company, and one from, well, another one from the university. Uh, so it was really complicated to open source, and we still haven't done that yet. But uh, over the years, I think there, there's at least two papers that have done a great survey on the existing technologies that unpack firmware. Uh, Andre Kostin from Eurocom, I think, had one survey paper that talked about that. So, you know, things are easier now, or like there are more tools now than there were 10 years ago. But uh, yeah, it's, this is something that, you know, actually is pretty difficult to automate 100%. Uh, you know, what we've done is you know, we've identified common firmware structures uh, or formats for, you know, major families of things. So, for example, Cisco IOS, uh, you know, things that run VxWorks. Right, once you figure out the format for one, you can go back and analyze firmware images for you know, hundreds of thousands of these, uh, typically, if you have access to that firmware. So you know, I think there are at least two different difficult problems. One, the structure right, of these firmware images that's proprietary, so mm -hmm. it's very difficult to share. And two, in some cases, it's really difficult to get firmware updates of devices from the vendor, even if you buy the device from the vendor and not from eBay. So getting access to the firmware, that, that's part of, you know, I think uh, the, the part where I now really helped us because they have this corpus of firmware. Uh, and yeah, you know, sharing the, the format of this firmware, you know, we can't do that publicly, right? Because uh, it's not a technical reason. I think that's much, much more of a YOLA and, you know, vendor opinion about yeah. what is proprietary and what people should look into is. But, you know, I hope this changes, right, as we go forward. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks.